Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Casper Sight. How the devil are you, mate? Today, we're looking into one of the Mind CTV individuals called Colton, okay? He's got his very own brand new channel now, so make sure you go to his channel, subscribe to it, and do that thing, okay? His, his channel is called Colton MS TV. Colton Microsoft TV. No, it's not Microsoft. Colton and Mind CTV, but it's Colton MS TV, all right? I'll leave the, the link in the description. Make sure you go to his channel, subscribe, and do the thing. And this one is called Why I Don't F with Ouija Boards. True story, okay? This is why he doesn't F with Ouija Boards. And this is why I say all the time, mate, don't mess with Ouija Boards, okay? I'm really interested to hear what he says. He's told me about it. I've said to him, I said, mate, 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 mate. Don't tell me about it because I want to react to it, okay? So I'm really looking forward to it. Let's see why he doesn't F with Ouija boards. Without further ado, da diddly day. Let's do this. Shh. Go on, Colton. Mind TV, MS TV. Oh, is this him when he was younger? Is the volume up? Jesus. Okay. What's that? Whoa, 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 whoa. Ouija boards and dark energy, the truth about everything. Colton, okay, okay. There are a lot of you that don't know much about me and how I came to be the third party with Hunting Purgatory, the investigation series. So, uh, I hit up Tanner. We were over at his place and he went out for a bit and I had some alone time with it myself, so I had turned off all the lights, you know, started staring into it, scrying into it for about 20, 30 minutes or so. And I mean, later that night, you know me, dude, like I don't really submit to all that stuff, but like I'm leaving his house and I severely sprained my ankle walking down the stairs. I've known Tanner for many, many years. I've been involved in a lot of things as far as paranormal investigation, but you could say that I was kind of born to do this. Most of my life, uh, growing up, I lived on Indian burial ground in Northern California. I oh, mate, he was literally born on a graveyard. <laughs> experienced many, many things um, around my neighborhood that remains unexplained to this day. There's a ton of history. If you want to look it up yourself, I'll leave some links below so you can kind of verify the area that I'm talking about. This is the first time I've gone on camera to explain what it is that is my major aversion towards things such as Ouija boards. Mm. When that I was three or four evil? years old, I moved from a historic area in San Jose, California to a place in South San Jose known as Campbell. It was just far enough away from my old house to have to change schools and find completely new friends. And in doing so, we kind of got into a lot of things that I mean, kids get into. Uh, the 90s was a time where, you know, a six, seven, eight year old could kind of like bounce around town with his friends and not really worry about it. We didn't have cell phones. It was a very come home before the street lights turn on. Yeah, that's true, man. It was true. It's just don't, don't come home before it gets dark. That's it. That's pretty much your instructions. Kind of environment that we lived in what a, what a life man what a life that was brilliant and as we got older we got a little bit more freedom our parents trusted us a little bit more and they trusted that we had good judgment not to get ourselves involved in ouija boards negative situations uh i didn't live in the best neighborhood um very mixed socioeconomic group. There was your standard drug houses. There was people that parents were business professionals and entrepreneurs. And we kind of existed in the same neighborhood around each other where we all went to the same school, San Anselmo Elementary. And right up the street was Bernal Middle School. So around that was the Santa Teresa Mountains. It's what separates San Jose from Santa Cruz. And it's well known to be an area that was inhabited by Native Americans for many, many centuries before we arrived. Okay. When I started approaching my preteen years, it was not uncommon for me to skateboard off with my friends, go jump a light rail. At Santa Cruz, yes, mate. And tell our parents we were at the park. <laughs> um, we used to explore those mountains. We had a lot of areas like Dottie's Pond. 
and that was the site of a young girl who was being bullied by a couple other older girls who ended up getting pushed into the pond and at the very bottom of it was nothing but what would be known as quicksand or really thick mud and she was sucked in and she oh, drowned. Oh, oh no! That area was fenced off for my entire youth. Oh, fucking hell, man. Oh, God, that would be absolutely fucking heartbreaking, mate. Oh, my God. That's the thing with kids, mate. If you've got kids, they're the best thing in the whole effing world. Like, you care about the kids more than your own, y- yourself, okay? But on the flip side, it is the scariest thing in the whole world for anything bad to happen to them. It's so amazing to have kids, but it's the scariest thing ever. We used to go, like, hang around there. Scarier than any fucking paranormal video, mate. Because it was a scary place to go where someone had passed away. And, you know, kids are interested in that kind of thing. But as I was growing up, I started experiencing a lot more things in my own home that were unexplained. Uh, I would see objects move in my own house. I would see things, especially in my kitchen area, um, be knocked over. We, me and my sister would walk home from school and we'd see, you know, like a complete disarray thinking to ourselves like, man, dad must have been in a hurry to leave the house. Her mom must have been in a hurry to leave the house when she what? dropped us off to school and then just left us here. So when you're a kid, you don't think that deep on things like that. So no, that's true. as I grew older and I started hearing the lore about the area that I lived in, it became more and more obvious to me that I was experiencing something that I was being told didn't exist, sort of. Because when you're a kid, you're growing up and... Be- yeah, monsters aren't real, there's nobody under your bed, you know? Or you're conditioned to believe, oh, ghosts don't exist and this doesn't happen and that's all, that's all make-believe. Before you're conditioned to do that, you're really seeing things through that your own eyes, seeing things as they happen, being present in the experience of seeing something unknown happen. I remember an instance where there was a holiday party at my sister's middle school. The side of her school is a crazy place alone. I mean, there's a story that you can actually probably look up online still. There was a book in her library that actually told about it of a Native American tribe that was slaughtered by settlers. That was, they literally lived all around our area, the base of the Santa Teresa Mountains. And um, there was a curse placed on the land, allegedly. People still say that they see apparitions of Native Americans, specifically a young girl in full regalia, beads, headdress, everything, walking around the campus and the area around the campus. So what- I, I, just, just to stop there for a second, you can actually see Colton um, genuinely feel like like he's he's narrating this all from his head it, it's not scripted you can tell that like, he's got emotion in it you can hear it in his voice he's got emotion in it he's relaying you know he's yeah he's uh this is from the heart one night we're at this holiday party ironically it was a halloween party i remember it like it was yesterday i was it was october 29th 1999 and there was a bunch of games there's bobbin for apples there's like uh, there's prizes to be won, little toys, gifts, whatever. They have a cakewalk, you know, things like that. But there was a back gym section of my sister's school that they used for like, you know, make a basket or throw the bean bags, knock the teeth out of the little smiling guy and get, get a kazoo or some sort of noise maker or something as a prize. And I remember this instance pretty, pretty vividly. That there better not have been a Ouija board at a bloody kid's party, mate. We were kind of all standing there. I was in line. I was like second or third in line to do the basketball game. And all of a sudden the lights start flickering and then they shut off completely. And in the corner of the room, there's these two emergency doors. Those fly open. And I could see clear as day with the emergency lights that are outside that no one's holding them open. A gust of wind comes in and like a, like a horror movie, starts swirling in the middle of the room and it starts picking up all sorts of things, popcorn, bags, trash, paper. And as it swirls for a couple seconds, it starts gusting towards the wall and it goes out the other emergency exit door. And as soon as the gust of wind carries all that debris out, the lights turn back on. And all the parents are looking at each other going, ooh, crazy, scary as if someone set it up. But in hindsight, even being a nine-year-old, I've always been a very- That must've been freaky as a nine-year-old. Actually confident person. And what I know now is that that is something that without a Hollywood budget cannot be orchestrated at all. That's, it was, it was a paranormal experience for sure. And I, I, I can't, I can't let go of those type mm. of memories in my mind. So those. Cause you could explain the wind coming through like that. Do you know what I mean? It, that, that's, 
probably isn't quite it isn't rare do you know what i mean but for the lights to go off at the same time and then come back on hmm but freaky deaky that is mate type of instances are what got me interested in the paranormal field in general as time went on i was you know i was uh a crazy young kid i started getting interested in it i mean obviously i was your standard like goosebumps reading are you afraid of the dark nickelodeon kind of kid but when I was getting into my preteens, my friends and I had developed this interest around the paranormal, and that was the time I had originally heard about Ouija boards. Mm. I remember telling my friends at school, one of which is now a Patreon subscriber to us, growing up that I thought my house was haunted, I thought that there was activity going on there, and a lot of the kids at school would think, you know, I'm crazy, or, you know, I'm making this story up for attention, but I, I stayed adamant on it. I mean, I went to that school from second grade till I was in sixth grade, and my story really see the problem is with that when people start mocking you and things you, you just end up keeping it to yourself and then it, uh, like it manifests into this big fucking secret you know that you want to tell people you can they never changed i was telling people like and I, what was crazy is like a lot of them lived on the same ground that i lived on they lived on this ground that was just completely embedded with native american body parts and bones and artifacts and all sorts of stuff that might contain some sort of mystical energy a friend of mine's older siblings actually had a Ouija board and he had access to it and he had mentioned to us, hey, my my older brother has this Ouija board that he used to play with with his friends and he says he won't touch it anymore, he won't even let me play with it. And so for about six months, he teased about it and said, you know, we should do the Ouija board, we should do this. We're all ages, uh, you know, 11 to 13, 14 years old. Finally one day it was dusk and we were out in the hills of Santa Teresa Mountains and we came across this old stable. I'm talking the thing was about oh, to fall. Mate. It was this old dilapidated wood horse stable that was just a covering to keep the rain off of their animals. And it was about dusk when we started walking down the hill and we heard we heard the sound of hooves. And you know, that's not uncommon for the area necessarily because people do have horses up there, but it sounded like a lot of hooves. You start hearing this gallop sounding like multiple horses. And then we started hearing shrieks and cries and like, the only way I can describe it is it sounded like Native American warriors charging into battle. Like, I, I have no other way to put it. I Jesus, really mate, he was tripping out at nine years old. What the F? And later that night, he was teasing, saying we should go back up there and we should do a Ouija board. We should do a Ouija board. And it was a Saturday night, so we decided that we were going to go ahead and do it. The time has come. We told our parents that we were staying the night at each other's houses. Very oh, common thing growing up. I'm sure a lot of you understand what I'm talking about. So that way we were kind of accounted for and we took the Ouija board and a handful of candles. I'm talking like scented candles and stick candles oh, and little tiny little uh, candles left over from Halloween for jack-o'-lanterns. And we took them into the middle of the canyon where the horse stable was. So the oldest of us was 13 and he had brought a lighter from home so he could go ahead and light the candles. And we had no idea what to expect from this. We just kind of like sat around in a circle and we started asking questions. You can understand at such a young age doing a Ouija board, no matter what's go what he's going to tell us now, how much this would scar you for the rest of your life. Already like, listening to the backstory. Questions. We were getting up from the circle, sitting back down. We were taking our hands off and picking our noses, whatever the hell we were doing. There were four of us, three of us sat in the circle and participated, and the sister of one of my friends sat outside of it because she was too afraid to participate based on things she'd heard. Can you fucking hear and shit now, mate? Don't know if it's the sound of here or my house. It's not my house. From her older siblings and things she'd seen on TV. And we decided that we were gonna do our first ever Ouija board seance. So we sat there and we asked questions. Are you a Native American? Did you die here? Uh, were you involved in any battles? And this went on for like 20, 30 minutes. We were getting up out of the circle, coming back, like nothing official. We didn't know the rules of the board. Mm. Um, the board was extremely old. I don't know if it came with instructions when he took it from his brother's closet or whatever, but it definitely wasn't present inside the box. So as we do the Ouija board, we're... I wonder if in the instructions of a Ouija board, when you buy it brand new, it says about um, closing you know when you say goodbye don't follow us or whatever you know i wonder if it says that or is that something that is just sort of happened through the paranormal world that you people have now started to say you need to say you need to do this or is like the instructions literally just gather your friends around or hold the planchet and just start talking to the ghosts and that's it you know 
we're starting to all like get a little bit more scared, a little bit more on edge, and we decide to call it quits and blow the candles out. So this is where it gets really heavy, and this is where it becomes hard for me to talk about. And it's it's one of those things where every time I tell this story, I I don't want to say that I start crying, but like it's almost like I can't control the water coming from my face. Um so I can't attribute exactly this event to it. It was just too close afterwards. It was too close afterwards for me not to think that it might have had something to do with it. Another friend that I was with, he was a year younger than me, and he was there participating in the Ouija board. I'm not going to say his name for privacy. Um, the person that is watching this, there might be one or two people that knew me growing up that is watching this. They know exactly who I'm talking about. Uh, we left and basically when we left and we went back to my house, he was quiet. He wasn't really his normal, usual self, very bubbly, very active, very chattery kind of kid. Um, he just seemed like something was off about him. This is the type of friend that I hung out with like every single day. His mom would take us to the skate park. We would go pretty much everywhere together. We would lie for each other to make sure that our bases were covered. Um, Man, this is getting quite intense. I'm, I'm really intrigued with what's going on there, mate. Monday came around and at school I was looking for him and I didn't see him. So I called his house and I asked his mom and she said that he wasn't feeling well and that he's kind of been like quiet and like in his own room and she doesn't know what happened. She asked me a bunch of questions with what had happened over the weekend and like I obviously was scared. I wasn't going to tell her like, hey, we lied and said we were staying at night at each other's houses and we took a Ouija board from so-and-so's older brother and we went and played with it on Indian burial ground in the middle of the canyon we weren't supposed to be at in the middle of the night. Again, this is one of those like really heavy situations because you have to understand the mental state someone's in, um, especially at that young of an age, to be able to do something like this. Mm. Uh, so, a few days went... I, I can understand what, why he's this is difficult for him to sort of relay because I'm I'm assuming he's going to be talking about some sort of paranormal experience that he's had, whether he's seen something, interacted with something, something like that. When you start to have that fear through the rest of your life and then you for the first time you start talking about it openly i would feel like that entity is still watching you listening to you relaying it back you know which is really and it's almost like it brings it real again it just brings all that sort of fear and insecurities all back up again you know of when you're back at your you're nine or ten, where, 12 years old where how old, i think he was like what did he say nine the oldest person there was 13 so he can't be any more than 12 years old but that's what i would imagine he's going through right now like that little child inside him thinking is this, you know am i doing the right thing should i be talking about this am i being listened to still by and I still hadn't had any contact with him. I'm already starting to feel it. <clears throat> I hadn't had any contact with him. And it was Tuesday, it was Wednesday, it was Thursday, it was Friday. I hadn't spoken at all. A couple of weeks go by and we find out that he... Oh, no, no, no. Oh, my fucking God, mate. Oh, my fucking God, no. Oh my fucking god. That's fucking horrible. Oh my god. They clearly blocked it out. But I think we know what that kid did. Right? I don't have to even say. They blocked these things out for for YouTube, by the way. <laughs> Otherwise, it just... It, it, YouTube just blocks it. Oh, my God. It's got a, a massive wave of emotion right then. Oh.
is just so profound to me. It's like there's this is a time in life where there should really be no stress. You're a kid, you're what could possibly be affecting you in that kind of way at that young of an age? Like we didn't hear anything from his mom. Um I mean rightfully so, like she's probably traumatized and extremely sad. Oh mate, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't be the same. You would never be the same. If anybody's out there any, fucking hell. <sighs> oh, fuck. If anybody's out there who's lost any... <laughs> Oh. If anybody, anybody's out there who's, who's lost a child, I'm so I'm sorry. I, I'm so sorry for you. Oh. I'm sorry, I just, uh, there's something, whenever I hear about kids hurting, pain, you know, and I just, uh, uh. sorry. As all of us were, um, but something intuitive inside of me, my intuition was saying that it had something to do with what we had done in the canyon that night. And for many, many years, I took a lot of responsibility for it. Um, I, I, I thought, I saw him as a person that looked up to me as a role model and the older friend that we were with, we kind of, he would look to us for like guidance and look up to us. And I think as an adult, I understand how much more powerful and profound that really is. That's a really good message. We all know someone that might be going through something. Pause this video and call them and tell them that you love them. That's a really good message. I was thinking about that the other day. You know, I thought it's, it's funny actually seeing that because I was actually thinking at the end of one of my videos, I might actually ask people to have a little look through their phone, scroll, and just do like a zip like that, and then stop, close your eyes and stop, and then look at that, look at that name. There is a reason why you put that person's name in your phone, and you probably haven't spoken to them for days, weeks, months, even years. Give them a call. You know, there's a reason why you you got their phone number. What would cause you to do something like that seemingly out of nowhere is still beyond me. It's something I've wrestled with the majority of my life. It's, it's not about doing these things and taking these risks and what's going to happen to you in the next few hours or what's going to happen to you tomorrow or during this period of time that you're doing a Ouija board session. It's more about how it's going to affect you in a couple days, a week, a month, or maybe not affect you, maybe affect someone that you love. It's a risk as an adult I've been apprehensive to take and I wish I had more foresight. I wish I had more foresight as a young person in regards to thinking these things are a game. Hmm. Yeah. You see, the thing is, it, like, <sighs> obviously it means a lot to him. Now, he must have had many conversations with Casey to say, look, mate, you know, these, these... Uh, don't get involved with these Ouija boards. And I can't remember now thinking about it, but since I've reacted to uh, Mindseed TV, I can't actually remember the last time I saw them do Ouija boards. Or am I just confused? Because, like, I can think about them doing Ouija boards a lot in every episode, but I'm just thinking, did they do one the last one? 
maybe he's had a conversation. I don't know. But, um, or maybe, you know, in case he's a, you know, he's, he, he's a big man. He'll do what he wants to do and he doesn't need to be told. And, you know, I'm sure they've had a conversation about it. So now those of you that have wondered, no. And those of you that have called me scared or a p um, understand where it's coming from. And also, I never get a chance to really convey how I feel about that. And I just want to say, f you. Uh, you have no idea the experience that I have with this type of stuff and you have no idea the effects it's had on me mentally and emotionally and the people that I love. A message to our viewers. My choice to get involved with this is purely based on the need for answers and closure for some of these things. So for those of you that are respectful and understand that a lot of these things we do are nothing to toy with and this is a very, very serious this is a very, very serious thing to get involved with. Regardless of us editing it to make it an entertaining show, we go to the darkest and scariest, most active places that are known to man. You can look them up on Google. There is literature written about them. There's hundreds. Of I'm glad he said that, you know, because, um, yeah, like th they go to these places. These are places are legit haunted places and things happen. But he didn't, he didn't sort of, because I do sometimes see a little bit of hate towards them and that, you know. Um, and he just said there, obviously, the editing, you know, they work with it to make it more entertaining. Which, that's the... In my mind, I would say that every single paranormal channel out there, every single one, edits in some way to make it punchy and you know film like you know like even in down to enhancing audio and stuff that's editing to in it you know to to capture that sort of moment to get you gripped into what's going on so i'm glad he said that he didn't beat around the bush he says yes we enhance it with the editing but we do go to these places which are freaky deaky you know of years of people telling stories and testimonials of this negative effects that these places have had, the entities they've experienced. Any of you who wish to follow in our footsteps, understand that you're opening yourself up to things that there may or may not be a remedy for. Anyway, that's my story. Wow, well, thank you, Colton, mate. Well, I, uh, that hit me like a ton of bricks, mate. That hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, yeah, this is why, because uh, this is why I don't, me, like me personally I, I i say all the time i know i jokingly do it i say don't mess with ouija boards but this is the things i've heard so many horror stories about ouija boards how it's changed people and affected people and some people say it's nothing's ever happened to them and you know whatever but it's not you know you've got to think about the risk to reward yeah what's the reward you're gonna get to the risk you, you could be taken and that's, I think, a good way of thinking about it. What's the risk to reward? And I think the risk outweighs the reward. Yeah. So anyway, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I'm sorry if it was an emotional one, you know, but I couldn't help it. When I when I hear about things like that and, um, uh, you know, being a father, uh, it affects me, you know, and I just I pick up on people's um, losses and stuff, you know people's pain so uh yes anyway guys thank you so much for watching <laughs> i will see you on the next one if you like the video please subscribe and um i'll see you on the next one take care bye bye get the merch at kespersite.com just rambo it